introduce this session, it's my privilege and pleasure to invite the newly elected global president of WZCC, Percy Master. So good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a nice lunch and you are not about to sleep. So greetings from WZCC. This special session on making the impossible possible, enhancing the global excellence through entrepreneurship has been very kindly sponsored by Diniar and Nahida Mehta from Orlando, Florida. Thank you, Nahida and Diniar. Very much appreciate your commitment to WZCC. We also have a privilege and honor to welcome Lord Karan Billy Moria. I hope he is here, but he will join us shortly. This uh, World Zarthusti Chamber of Commerce current focus team is power of youth driving future generations. I am proud to inform you that this year the average age of global directors on the board of WZCC has come down considerably, meaning more young directors are on board, so are more women directors on board than ever before. We want to practice gender equality. WZCC mission, building the spirit of entrepreneurship. To do this, WZCC has taken a lot of initiatives to encourage the community, especially the youth, to learn about and to practice entrepreneurship. Youngpreneurs program cultivates young children from the age of 10 and above and motivates them to be the future entrepreneurs. WZCC ZFN network encourages young students into higher education by providing relevant information and even offering a loan scholarship to study entrepreneurship. We have the V wing, women entrepreneurs, and the youth wing. And now we have introduced Spotlight, which shows cases of inspirational success stories of individuals. For budding entrepreneurs needing finance, we offer interest-free loans of up to 25 lakhs in India and US dollar 50,000 in North America. We now have WZCC news every quarter. The flyers given are on the, your table. Please use them to link and view the latest edition of news, WZCC news. It's very interesting. We require your support. By offering these added incentives, we now invite our young and generation to take advantage of it, to chase their dreams, and to make the impossible possible. Entrepreneurship. This concept was developed by Joseph Schupeter, which in German language is called Enthammer, which means caretaker, or one who takes good care of one's business. When the book was republished in English, the word entrepreneur was coined. This was later defined as entrepreneurship is the pursuit of opportunity beyond resources available. So an opportunity is visualized, which frequently others do not see. And because of pursuit beyond available resources, creativity and innovation are required, which in turn involves a little bit of calculated risk. Ladies and gentlemen, an entrepreneur is a doer and not just a dreamer. The entrepreneur must be able to say, I create, I take risks, I love my passion, and I am an entrepreneur. In every success story, you will find someone who has made a courageous decision. Impossible only means that you haven't found a solution yet. Today, we have a panelist who have made the impossible possible and we want them to share their experiences with you. The panel is a very selective one with a mixture of experience and youth, bridging generations and continents. Having identified an opportunity, they with their creativity and innovation took calculated risk and with networking and collaborative action succeeded. Their actions involved purpose, passion, persistence, and providence in order to succeed, 
and create intellectual, economic, and social values. Elements of each exist in every enterprise, but the best outcome is when domain overlap is maximized. Entrepreneurship has many facets, and even professionals, educa educators, and social workers can be entrepreneurs, and it is never too late to become one. We must also remember that everyone cannot be an entrepreneur. One must have leadership qualities, decision-making prowess, and a certain amount of risk-taking, albeit a calculated one. An entrepreneur must have the requisite skills and be properly educated in his, her field to succeed. Let us not forget that our forefathers succeeded and made a lot of money but gave it back to the society in equal measure. Today's panel discussion reflects on the ability and conscious decision for entrepreneurs to create intellectual, economic, and social values. It is of utmost importance to remember to work towards success with happiness and social commitment and to give back to the community. Ushtate, happiness unto all. I look forward to our panelists fostering a dialogue that I'm sure will inspire and motivate many of you today to see entrepreneurship in a different light. And maybe you too can and are working to make the impossible possible. With this, I have great honor to invite Farooq Mistry to take this session forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Percy. And it is my privilege and honor to moderate this session. Uh, we started at 2.45 p.m. and it is our intention to finish uh, before 4.15. And uh, this morning, you heard uh, some fantastic talks. One from Karan Bilimoria, where he talked about entrepreneurship and how he looks at entrepreneurship in the context of Zerationism. And the other, uh, from the leaders talking to leaders. And there was again the mention of entrepreneurship. It seems that entrepreneurship is in the DNA of the Zarathustra community. Percy mentioned entrepreneurship as being the DNA of the WZCC. And the, the importance of WZCC now placing on educating and promoting the next generation of entrepreneurs. <coughs> So with that, I'd like to introduce the, the panel. Uh, the, the descriptions are given on page 78, so you may like to look at that. So we have uh, the opening remarks by Percy Master. The, for, intellectual va for intellectual value, we have <coughs> Poros Balsara and Dariush Mehta. For social value, we have Pirus Kambata, who cannot be here with us today because his mother is not well. And filling in for him is Percy Master. And we have Jehan uh, uh, Kotwal for, social, uh, for, uh, for intellectual entrepreneurship. Jehan, raise your hand. Let them see who you are. <laughs> and then we have Rointan Mehta and Mira Mehta. And they are not, uh, they are not uh, father and daughter. They're not related, but they have a very similar trajectory in terms of who they are and what they wish to do. And Karishma Koka is going to synthesize what happens in this session. And Lord Birimoria will be coming at the end and sharing his thoughts and putting what we have said in the context of his worldview of what Zerashtrianism, uh, Zerashtrian entrepreneurship is about. <coughs> So I'd like to share with you the structure of what we're going to be doing. Each panelist has four minutes to make their opening statement. Four minutes. Panelists, don't forget. Start your watches. Then they have one slide. There'll be prompts from the moderator, that is me, and each panelist will have 60 seconds to reply, not go on and on and on, but 60 seconds to the point to reply, and if they don't do it, I'll stop, stop them. Then comes uh, the synthesis that Karishma will do. She'll take what the, the panelists have put together and relate it to Zoroastrian doctrine. 
because it's very important. It's okay to have a Zoroastrian entrepreneur, but we want to show what they have done as Zoroastrian entrepreneurs and how it ties to Zoroastrian doctrine. Now for the question and answer from the floor, you'll find that there are cards on each of your tables. We would like you to write down the questions that you have and would the runners please stand and identify yourselves. Uh, these are the young folks who are going to come along and take the cards and give them to Idil Dava, who is here. Where is Idil? Right here, okay. And then Idil will pass them on to me and we'll have the Q&A. And then we will have Lord Curran Billimoria who will give us his thoughts. We are all going to be here, and we'd love to talk to you, and we can do that outside once this is finished. So with that, it is my privilege and pleasure and honor to invite Porus to say a few words. Thank you, Farouk. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Porus Balsara, and it's my pleasure to share my story with you guys. I was born and brought up in Bombay, India. I'm an ordained and a practicing Zoroastrian priest. I completed my schooling at the Parsi school, uh, Sir JJ, so for those of you who are from Bombay, they know what I'm talking about. So my parents did not have the fortune of attending college, and, but they, especially my mom, uh, con constantly instill the value of education and excellence in us. Also, whilst growing up, I watched my dad serve in various positions uh, in our cooperative housing society, voluntary positions, for over 40 years, till he was 92. Subsequently, the value of service was reinforced and strongly supported by my wife, Pearl, who also actively volunteers in, in our community and our children, Farah and Burzin, who also do the same whenever they can. So whilst growing up, I enjoyed tinkering with toys and things around the house, or as my mom says, doing bang tor and, uh, and, and uh, uh, to tok tak kind of stuff. So. so I decided that I need to pursue my uh, education in engineering, so I got my degrees in engineering. I uh, work... Uh, my, my current interests are in energy efficient circuits and systems. I worked in, uh, all, at all levels, uh, all the way from low level, uh, low voltage uh, integrated circuits, all the way to kilovolt uh, converters. So there are several values that I hold dear and, and have impacted my life and in my career in several ways. But here are the major ones. Uh, first one is uh, pursuit of excellence and in, with integrity, with passion and integrity. Uh, I look at challenges in front of me as opportunities to become better, to learn new things, and not as adversities or obstacles. And to do that, I need to focus and drive away any distractions. Then only I can proceed further. A service I already talked about is a way for, for me to give back to the community, not just in monetary sense, but also in terms of my time. Uh, gratitude. Uh, somewhere, somebody has always helped me directly or indirectly, and I'm always thankful for that. And at this point, I would like to thank all my students. They are not here, but without them, I cannot exist as a professor. Uh, humility. We are all human beings and are prone to make mistakes, so one should accept successes and failures with humility. So career-wise, I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering, and I'm vice dean of the engineering school at the University of Texas at Dallas. So we educate students to create human and social value. As, a faculty, as faculty members, we consider ourselves intellectual entrepreneurs who challenge the status quo and look for opportunities to innovate. We mentor our graduate students uh, in research and innovation, to create knowledge and contribute towards intellectual and economic value. Throughout my career, I have changed my research area several times, each time as an outsider to the area, in spite of the fact that sometimes we were, my students and I were ridiculed by people working in that area. I teach my students to not settle for incremental improvements, but to persevere, work hard, and make radical changes and bring those changes to fruition. So as intellectual uh, entrepreneurs, 
We promote academic, social, cultural, economic changes by synthesizing, integrating, and harnessing talent and ideas from wherever possible. So just like business entrepreneurs, we do propose new ideas, we seek funding, we, we innovate, we contribute uh, and communicate our ideas, and we sometimes even create uh, economic value, may not be for us, but definitely for a lot of others. So after I move on, after I pass on my legacy, I would like it to be someone who empowered his students and his children to contribute towards economic, social, intellectual value, and as a person uh, for my service to the community and others, as a person who brought joy to others and, uh, and brought values in their lives. So thank you very much, and I now pass on the mic to Dariush, my colleague. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Boris. Uh, it's been really great getting to know the entire panel uh, over the last uh, few months as we've prepared for you today. As Boris mentioned, my name is uh, Dariush Mehta. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be here among you. And uh, Zagba in the house. Zagba in the house and a lot of Mehtas in the house. <laughs> right there. Uh, in the next few minutes, I'd like to share with you uh, the underlying theme, this common theme that ties my story, or as you see here, the gears uh, underlying my life. And whether we like it or not, we're a product of our past, our ancestors, as we've been hearing about this whole conference. Uh, my story includes the late Dasturji Noroz Minocher Homji, uh, I unfortunately was seven when he was passed, uh, when he passed on. Uh, we call him Daddy Da. Uh, I know many of you come up to me and say he did my wedding, he did my Novjot, he was there for me, and he gave people a voice. He was a progressive, preeminent scholar, came to the States and traveled all over the world to spread the good word. Somehow, I am here to continue his legacy, so I constantly remember him, and I'm not ordained in any way, but I'm somehow continuing his legacy, so I always remember him uh, and thank him for that. Dinyar Mehta, I heard my mom and dad's name, Dinyar Mehta and Nahida Mehta. So Dinyar Mehta is my, uh, my dad. Uh, he's an entrepreneur in Disney World, USA, in Florida, and a center of tourism and he has built hotels from the ground up. He doesn't talk about it a lot, but what I've seen him do, that model, has been the template for what I, uh, I'm doing myself. Uh, my dad would rush to people's help. He would drop everything, change the tires on the car of a stranger, and wouldn't need anything in return. And that is better than any any kind of word of advice that he could have given me. Just a couple of days ago, he said he was doing something similar <laughs> to, a, uh, to, uh, to help somebody. Uh, my mom, uh, Nahida Mehta, uh, is an educator, and uh, she is the glue that gave me and my two sisters the voice of reason and a strong commitment to education throughout our entire life. So that was the seed planted in me to create intellectual value the rest of my, uh, rest of my life. Uh, I stayed in Florida, I grew up in Florida, I stayed in Florida, the University of Florida, to get my bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, so Porus and I are kindred spirits. Uh, electrical engineering, computer science, and a minor in music. I'm, the I'm a clarinet player, a saxophone player, so by day I would code, well, by night I'd code, build circuits, and uh, by night I'd be a jazz sax player, be in symphonies, I marched, I was a band geek. So somehow those two minds uh, merged for the PhD. I came to Boston and an MIT-Harvard joint program was in this interesting field of speech and hearing, bioscience and technology, and that brought the science of acoustics, the art of music, into helping people Give, give people a voice who have physically lost their voice. 
So there are doctors and therapists who are rehabilitating those uh, whose voice is suffering. That planted the seed for me to have social impact in uh, my career. Thank you. Is that the four minute or the three minute? Thank you for... Then I will uh, wrap up with the last phrase to say, meet me after and give, and we'll continue the conversation. I'll speak softly and be compassionate to others. I am going to pass on, thank you. Since uh, Piruz Kambata is not here, uh, there is a recording. We'll be hearing from him. So thank you, uh, Farooq. Uh, greetings from my personal self, from Bata family, greetings from India. I know I'm missing the whole action. I could have loved to be there. There are family members, friends sitting in the audience, but sometimes, you know, things are beyond your control. So I'm here so giving this video recording. And we're going to talk of a very interesting topic of the Russian way of value creation, especially for the youth who are either in say family business or wanting to join some, or what you have a startup or who are looking at options of between, between a job and between their own work, how we can create value. And let me tell you today, we are family businesses, but today we are also startups only because otherwise family businesses don't last. So today I'm also going to talk about what is that, what is, what is that extra thing which is required for that. Now coming to the most important topic on the table is how do we create value? And I do believe that if you have a choice, it is always important to take up entrepreneurship in socially development projects where you can also impact things like yeah, food processing, where you can impact the farmer. For example, Rasna helps the farmer in double the income by ensuring a better price. And for example, we work with the bottom of pyramid to ensure that the people at, at the lowest level have a nutritious fruity drink at say, let us say two cents, three cents. And we have followed this up not only in India, but today in 53 countries, especially the sub-Saharan desert, where all Rasna is today a necessity not a luxury with vitamins, minerals, glucose. So that is, I think, what is our contribution to society. Of course, we are making money, but we are making money also by ensuring we are also making health. Now coming to what are the other important areas where we work on better ROI for all our partners, because I do believe that for us, their pleasure is important. Ensuring that we give variable packages to our employees, long-term contracts, ensuring that we buy mostly from MSMEs because we want to support the small and medium industries in India. Sustainability is very important for us. And affirmative action, sustainability, especially because Rasna is a concentrate. When you Rasna, you say you 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 say you save we on the fuel because then you don't need bulky transportation. You you also don't need plastics. So I think that is the beauty of having concentrate. And not only that, we use whatever packing material we use, we use recycle. But similarly, affirmative action, we hire from the physically challenged people. We hire, we, 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 we hire from, let us say, the backward price, the schedule price, but now many, many years and much more than any stipulation. Similarly, CSR, we are spending more than 10% of our profit on various community projects, job fairs, COVID relief, free eye surgeries, road scholarships, radiotherapy machines, and a lot of other things. But not to forget, that today, if you want to be, let us say, a real development engine with the government, we need to partner with the government. So we partner with the government in various projects of the government. Because we can't just say the government will work and we won't. Industry has to partner with the government on socially relevant projects, like, for example, the Make in India program, the import substitution program, the CSR policy, the tax reform. Similarly, we have to partner with the education institutes, because that's where the youth are. We need to work with them. We need to give them scholarships, endowments. We need to be on the boards. We need to guide them. We need to make the education what we need. That, that is, I think, most important. And then to champion the change, we also need to be a leading voice of our industry. We can't sit in dining rooms and say, this is not happening, this is not happening. How do we channelize the industry stem? How do we work together as industry to ensure that our, our needs, industry's needs, are really uh, communicated to the government with various associations taking the lead in that, that is something which our family has been doing for many years and will continue to do. But most important, let me tell you, today, value creation doesn't mean only profits in your bank or being on some Forbes list or being the richest man somewhere. It means how you are impacting society at large. And I'm so happy that Rasna is definitely impacting society at large in every, every manner, in small or big, I told you the compass of which you are activity. And I'm sure in the end, all this is for one reason, development of India. Because today, we have to see ourselves not as community 
or for our company, but for our country. And I'm very happy that our efforts are actually working towards an inclusive growth of the country. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Jehan Kotwal and uh, from Mumbai, India. How many Indians are in the house? All right, very few. Good. <laughs> so um, I think uh, you heard from Piruz, uh, and for every Indian, I think Rasna is predominantly the brand that people recognize uh, you know, as, a, as a fun drink, energy drink. And he's one, I know a lot of our panelists here are incredible entrepreneurs. Um, for me, my background uh, is, and what I do, I'm the CEO of JFK Transporters, um, founder of Good Mind Private Limited, and also founder of Humsafer Driver Safety Foundation. So very passionate about business, like super passionate. Um, and I think one of the big things for me and my journey, at least for the youngsters here, uh, I want to tell you that it hasn't been uh, anything but uh, easy, uh, simply because I was one of those kids in school that was really, really bad at studies. Um, just to give you a you know, broad line, what, what that definition is, if there were eight subjects, I would fail in like six of them. So I was a horrible student. Uh, I loved sports, and uh, because of which, uh, you know, I was one of the most naughtiest uh, kids in school. I was so naughty that they actually made me the disciplinary secretary of the school, and uh, which was a mistake, I think, because uh, that just made, made things worse. But uh, yeah, I think for, for me at least, uh, the starting was pretty rough. Uh, my father was a truck driver and uh, we, he started his business. Uh, typically, we had about 10 trucks at the time. And uh, essentially, when I was about 18, I had started my first venture. It was in college. Uh, we started a cafeteria with two of my best friends. And uh, then after graduating, I realized I really loved business. So I majored in entrepreneurship. I minored in international studies. Uh, if if I think, look, if I look back and my dad wanted to shut his company down, he was like, I'm, I'm done with this line, I don't want to do it anymore. I said, let me just try it out, I started a business anyway, let me see if I can take something and scale it. And so, uh, what do you call, that's what I did. And at the time, we used to have about 10 trucks and we used to have two, three accidents every year. Uh, and that was something that really bothered, bothered me as an entrepreneur. I, I didn't want anyone to get hurt, and that's not the business that I wanted to be a part of. So I set out to build GFK as the safest trucking company in India. And uh, yeah, no, it's not a big deal. Thank you. And we did that. So I don't know if you can see the picture. So it's pretty, yeah. I went on the trucks, figured out how to make it safer. And by the time we had about 110 trucks, we had one accident in the whole year. So that essentially changed the whole game. Uh, which gave birth to my new uh, company, which was Good Mind Private Limited, where we use AI to reduce road accidents by truck drivers. And the foundation also works in the same space. So in India, we have almost 415 people die every day in road accidents. And hopefully, with our application, we can save about 100 lives a day. So that's one of the biggest things that I'm hoping to uh, work towards, and that's my dream. Uh, finally, uh, thank you. Uh, finally, I'd just like to add, because I know Farouk's going to whip me in a bit uh, if I don't do it in four minutes, but um, the aspiration, what I want to tell the youngsters, and since I'm one of the young ones here, um, is that you know all of us are given this God-gifted talent, and I think our purpose is to live our life through that. And each of us, like for me, it was business and entrepreneurship. For somebody, it could be my younger brother, for example. He's an opera singer. And we're completely different, but he just does what he loves doing, and so do I. And so the idea and the Zoroastrian philosophy for even good mind, Bahumano, is uh, you know, to make sure and the life that we want to live is to be happy by making others happy. And of course, uh, you know, when you run three companies, I think it's only possible if you're single. But uh, <laughs> I think uh, the big thing is to lead a balanced life, right? And to do it in a way that uh, you, know, you can try and make sure that uh, everybody stays happy and do it with a good mind. So on that note, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure being here. Am I, am I audible? Sorry. For now, for the social value, I'd like to introduce Rohintan. Thank you.
I was born in Ahmedabad almost 74 years ago in a very conservative Parsi fa middle class family. My mother, who was only a high school graduate from Wadia Vacha School in Matunga, emphasized on excellence in education and at the same time our Zoroastrian DNA of giving back to the underprivileged and the poor in our society. From a very young age, the seeds of entrepreneurship somehow had germinated in my mind. I was fortunate enough to having admitted to one of the most competitive colleges in India. I studied at IIT Bombay, graduated in chemical engineering, and like it was normal in my times, um, came to the US and earned several multiple degrees in chemical engineering and in uh, engineering administration. I spent the first 15 years of my professional career in corporate life, rising up to the level of being a general manager for a large division of a multinational company. But I was restless by the time I was in my very early 40s and felt that I needed to be my own boss. So over the next 25 years, I got into heavy duty plastics manufacturing. And we had operations in New Jersey at different times during those 25 years, in California, in Pennsylvania, in Hebron, Kentucky, in North Carolina, and also an operation in Brampton, Ontario. One of the most satisfying things was that over that period, we were able to employ almost a thousand or more people. And it gave me a great deal of satisfaction. At one point, we even tried to start a manufacturing operation in India, but did not succeed. This was in the early 90s. We were able to empower our employees by giving back to them in areas that they needed the most, like establishing critical assistance fund, because we operated our plants 24 seven. And if an employee did not show up to work on the graveyard shift, we would suffer a deep loss. So by giving simple loan of $500 that would allow them to fix their car and come to work, well, that was good enough. So that's one kind of social and entrepreneurship and empathy and developing trust and loyalty. Since 2013, when I sold my last company in California, I have pretty much become a full-time social entrepreneur. And I've been involved with a wide variety of nonprofit activities, almost all of them in India, in the areas of excelling in higher education and primary education, and addressing critical issues of the day, such as water and sanitation, maternal and child health. I seriously plan, and I am hopefully on my way to giving away a substantial portion of my wealth to benefit communities in India. Thank you. Some of my professional role models are people like Andrew Carnegie and Jamsedji Tata. Carnegie believed that you spend the first third of your life in learning, the second third in trying to amass wealth, and the final third to give it away to people who need it more than you. Jamsedji Tata established, or his, he, he started, and I guess he did not, he was not alive by the time Indian Institute of Science was founded, but he has also been involved, the Tata group, in a phenomenal number of educational institutions that are totally secular in nature. To give you an example, I've been involved with Akanksha Foundation, I'm on their US board, where we run 26 charter schools in Bombay, Pune, now in Nagpur, and hopefully my desire is to build two such charter schools in a municipal public-private partnership in Ahmedabad. I've been also heavily involved, and I'm on the board of advisors of Dakshana Foundation, 
where we train about 450 students from the poorest communities in India to take the most rigorous exam in India called the Joint Entrance Exam. We have over a 60% acceptance rate, and for the last six, seven years, we are training 250 medical students with the same level. Again, I'm connected with the other IITs. Thank you very much, and I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Meera Mehta, for her story. Can you guys hear me? There's like a weird echo up here, so hopefully it's okay down there. My name is Mira Mehta, and I make tomato paste in Nigeria. You guys should have a sample on your table, so you're welcome to take that home with you. You might ask why and how. I'm gonna try and tell you in four minutes. So my dad is a Zoroastrian Indian Parsi. My mom is a white Finnish Lutheran. They moved to the States, they had me. I grew up in the Vedanta faith, so um, like the Swami mentioned on Friday, under the you know, sort of value system that there's one truth and there's many paths to that truth. Um, like many young Zoroastrians, my parents placed an unspoken pressure on me to bring home A's. They never said it, but I knew I was supposed to, um, and I did. Um, but I also learned a few other things that they didn't explicitly teach me uh, about Vohumana. So, you know, my, my mom worked multiple jobs when I was a kid to support um, my, our family while my dad was building his business. He built his company out of the first floor of our house. Um, and eventually it got way bigger. But, you know, in the early days, it was things were a little tight. They were putting our tuition on credit cards. You know, my mom was working all these jobs, but my dad always had a dollar to give to the guy, you know, who was panhandling outside of the car at the red light or at the corner. And that kind of stuck with me, right? This idea that my parents were always willing to see and acknowledge the humanity in people that most other people just wanted to ignore and wanted them not to sort of be there, right? And so that was internalized in me in addition to the uh, good grades. And so, you know, as I went through school, I wanted to be the best at everything I was doing. I was super competitive, and I channeled that initially into academics, but then in high school I took up rowing, and I channeled it into athletics as well. And that was huge for me because um, competitive team sports taught me about the value of teams over individuals. It taught me about the value of time management, which hopefully I will be able to do today. Um, the importance of taking personal ownership of both your victories and your defeats, and also the importance of staying present and not letting something that happened in the past determine what you're doing today or how you're gonna approach things tomorrow. So, you know, with that all in my toolkit, I took on my first job, um, mostly out of competitive desire to get a top job, not because I actually wanted to work in finance, so lesson to the young kids, you know, sometimes, like, just winning for the sake of winning isn't necessarily gonna make you happy. Um, that really came into focus for me because on a, on a trip I went on um, to Africa, I went on a safari, and my friends went to this orphanage and we were like giving out pens to the orphans. And I was like, wait a second, I have a degree in public health. All these kids are orphaned from HIV. I should probably be doing more than giving them pens. Like I actually have a degree that could be way more valuable. So I quit my job in finance, I moved to Nigeria, I worked for the Clinton Foundation for four years, and that felt closer to right, but it still didn't feel like what I wanted to do. I wanted to control my own destiny, I wanted to you know, live and die by my success, I didn't want to just do whatever the donors wanted us to do. Um, and, and I had this crazy idea about tomato paste. So I went back to school, I was very fortunate to get into Harvard, I decided to brush up on finance and entrepreneurship, um, and learn how to sort of act confident when you're not, which is a big part of business school. Um, and then I went back to Nigeria. It is, it's true. And then I went back to Nigeria and started this business. So what is Tomato Joss? Tomato Joss is a for-profit social enterprise. And what we do is we work with smallholder farmers who farm on less than one hectare of land to grow tomatoes for us. Um, we have empowered over a thousand farmers so far and increase their yields from five tons per hectare to 50 tons per hectare, so massive increase in productivity um, and increase in their profits. So, so they, you know, they get a loan from us, they get about a 30 to 40% return on their loan, so they go away happy. We're happy because we're able to source tomatoes at a globally competitive price and then turn it into this fast-moving consumer good, tomato paste, that we sell in Nigeria um, and we're competing against multi-billion dollar companies, so if you guys want to help us out, you're welcome to. 
Um, and you know, we just launched our product after eight hard years of work in March. So extremely happy to be here, um, happy to take questions later. And with that, I will pass it back to Farouk. Thank you. At this stage, I would like to remind you that there are cards on the table. And we are going to uh, uh, give the, uh, please give them to the volunteers who will then bring them to Adel. He will organize them, and we will have questions from the floor. Please join me in thanking these six people in putting together a wonderful story of each of their lives. Each has demonstrated how they went about living their lives, making money, giving back what motivates them, and it's absolutely fantastic. So now we come to the second part of this uh, uh, panel, and here I'm going to, as moderator, ask a certain set of questions to the panelists. And each panelist has 30 seconds to respond. So Porus, first question is for you. Boris, you have recognized that action is anchored in purpose, passion, persistence, and providence. And you talk to your students. Persistence, a purpose, passion, persistence, and providence is something that comes from the economic domain. How do you translate that to the intellectual domain? It comes in the intellectual domain also, and I think it comes in all the domains, because whatever task that you want to do, if you do not have the passion, and if you do not have the fire in the belly to complete the task, you will never complete it. So for my students also, I tell them that whatever you want to pursue, pursue it with passion, fire in the belly, and they ask, when will I know that I have fire in the belly? I said, when your belly is empty and you don't feel hungry, thirsty, you don't know whether it is day or night, you lose track of time, that's when you'll know that's your passion. So continue that and you will do that because that's the only way you can face failures and look at failures as stepping stones to success. So. Thank you. <laughs> Darius, over the past two months, I've come, two and a half months, I've come to know you. And one of the things that has struck me is that you are very uh, purposeful about creating a shared vision for not just your students, but yourself. So please share with us that vision, and then how do you empower the students to learn and grow so the team is more than the sum of the parts? That, that, thanks for that uh, uh, question, Farouk. So the, the, the question is the shared vision. Uh, about five years ago, uh, our lab was fortunate to get an $11 million grant from NIH to study voice disorders. And the task following getting the grant is to actually do what you wrote down in the grant. And you build a team using the funding. You already have the ex executive committee, the PIs, the principal investigators. Then you amass the engineers, the clinicians, the, the secretar secretarial staff and creating the shared vision of the goal to study voice issues so that we can then help the clinician, the surgeon treat that population is what we did five years ago. So that's an example of uh, making sure the team feels like a team so that we are more than the sum of our parts. Our roles are not just siloed. We have to uh, create the synergistic relationship. Thank you. And now this is a question for Pirouz. We tried to bring him in on Zoom, but we're not able to do so. So he sent us a, a, a response to this question, and Percy is going to read out the answer. I've come to know Pirouz over the last month and a half, and what I'm intrigued in his presentation is that he talks about a manager, a leader, and an entrepreneur. So Percy, on behalf of Pirouz, could you share his views of what is the difference between a manager, leader, and an entrepreneur? Uh, thank you, Farouk. 
Hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Farooq. Uh, I will just repeat what Piruz has said in his uh, uh, message. The question of difference between manager, leader, and entrepreneur is a question that I have always liked. And I already said probably in some other session also that a manager, leader, and entrepreneur, the difference is between like a lion in a zoo, a lion in a circus, and a lion in a jungle. I think the entrepreneur has to be a jungle lion. He has to have what I call raw nerves. And he has to not follow the dictates or dictates of the zero lion or a circus lion. If you unleash that potential in you of a lion in a jungle, you'll be able to become a more successful entrepreneur. My take as a president of WZCC, I would say that you know, entrepreneur has to be very careful how he cultivates his business. He has to take calculated risk. And when you take a calculated risk, you have to also visualize your escape route. You cannot take a risk, take loans, and then not pay them. That is not a Zerthusti way of doing business. So I would recommend that all youngsters or all entrepreneurs when they take a calculated risk, they must also have an escape route. They must know that they can only do this much and not more, and that then they have to call it a close and then pay back the loans. Because unless you don't develop that creditability, you will never succeed, and you will never get future loans. So be very careful how you go about taking loans. Thank, Thank you. you. Jihan, I've come to know you after the, uh, over the last two and a half months, and it's been delightful to know your passion and what you wish to do and, and provide for the youth. So my question to you is looking back on your life and career, please share two bits of advice for parents first and then the next generation of entrepreneurs. Jihan, parents first, let the parents listen and then to the entrepreneurs and uh, to their children. Go ahead. So for parents, and again, I, I think it's a slightly biased because I, I know mostly Indian parents. <laughs> so I think the biggest thing is to have faith in their children and uh, to know that and to and kind of empower them. Uh, you know, in India, what's happened over the last few uh, decades is that Everyone's gone into their cushy jobs, and you know we have bugs, and we have everything set for them. So the, that fire is kind of diminished to a very large degree. Uh, so I think for parents, it's very important to encourage the kids. And the biggest thing is to just teach them the right values of good mind. Uh, you know, make sure that it's not it's the child's happiness that's more important, not their own. Uh, security is always good, but if you don't let the person flourish and and really do what they really want to do. Uh, that's not going to be the best, uh, you know, for the kid. And so for the parents, I would advise that uh, just give your kids the freedom and, you know, give them, give them the support they need. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Ronkin, I have known you for over a year and a half now, and I admire what you've done and admire the way in which you have interacted with me. So my question to you is the following. Looking back on your life and career, Please set, share two bits of advice for parents and the next generation entrepreneurs. I would like to advise that try and create a shared vision and to be, to help the bright young people to succeed in life through excellence in education. The very first step is to get educated in a, and I don't mean just get second class marks. I'm sort of, that tells you I'm dated by saying second class. You want to excel, you want to thrive, you want to aspire to give back. Second, we are admired as Parsis, Zoroastrians in India for the values that we create and by the way, I'm not a very religious person, but I strongly believe in our Zoroastrian concept 
of trust, integrity, loyalty, harmony, and other such values. That's why we are universally admired in India. Please keep that up. Thank you. Mira, I have come to know you over the last two, two and a half months, but I know your father since 50 years ago, since we are both in high school together. And having heard you, uh, uh, having heard you, having listened to what you've said, the question for you is the following. You have gone out to Nigeria and started a business. And so my question to you is, in the context of an entrepreneurship of making the impossible possible, please highlight an example, one example, of what and how you made everyone, that everyone thought was impossible, possible. The theme of our, of our panel. Great, thanks so much. I'll use a, a recent example. Um, I raised my Series A um, like equity round uh, in 2020. In January of 2020, I raised $5 million with the intention to build my factory because we started with um, working on improving farmer productivity and then decided, okay, now that we have the supply chain fixed, let's go ahead and put in the factory. Well, as you all know, COVID hit in March. Um, my equipment was from an Italian manufacturer and Italy was one of the hardest hit countries. So, you know, we paid a down payment of probably like $700,000 on our equipment in February, only to have everything shut down. Um, construction jobs were all put on a halt. They were not considered essential business. I ended up flying with my partner back to the US in May um, and we're like, how the hell are we gonna get this factory built? You know, what are we gonna do? Um, but I had, you know, again, leveraging the power of teams, right? I have a really, really great team in Nigeria that really believes in what we're trying to do, that wants to be a part of something that is bigger than just a paycheck. And so, you know, while I was languishing in the US, um, my team back in Nigeria selected an engineering okay. firm, a construction firm. As soon as we were able to start construction, they broke ground in August. And between August and February, they built the physical factory. And, you know, somehow we were able to keep making the payments to the Italian manufacturers. They were able to get the equipment sent out only a couple months behind schedule. We started installing equipment, 16 containers worth of equipment in a factory that didn't have a roof in a very dusty country. The Italian guys were like, we can't do this. This is not, you know, reg, blah, blah, blah. We're like, no, look, we just, we gotta catch the season. We're gonna do it. Um, and everybody pitched through. We worked through Christmas. We worked, you know, seven days a week. We had, um, everybody really came together. And by March of 2021, um, we were making tomato paste. So that's just one example of you know, the crazy stuff that we have to do. But when you believe in something and you're able to instill that dream in other people, um, it's amazing, you know, the things you can accomplish. Thank you. <laughs> and Karan, Karan, these six panelists have touched what you talked about today in a slightly different way. They're giving you practical examples, just like you gave us, they are giving you practical examples from their lives, the stories they've shared with all of us. Now we are going to s switch a little bit. We told you, uh, Percy told you that we have an intergenerational panel. We have a senior person and a junior person. So now the round is in, the question that I have for you, Boris, is now that you've heard the life story of Darius, what is the takeaway you will share with the parents and the children here? Listening to Darius talk, uh, I must say that we are definitely not nerds. We definitely have other dimensions in our lives. He, he plays music. I played volleyball for my colony. My two teammates are right here, Burgess and Rushard. I played volleyball for college. Darius synthesized music in his research. And listening to Darius and talking about present generation, uh, I remember the words of my friend Arda saying that the most popular degree these days is MBA. Uh, it's not the MBA that you guys are thinking about. It's the MBA which stands for Mane Baddu Aurage. <laughs> I think Darius 
proves that if we keep our mind open to lots of uh, different ideas, a lot of new things can come our way. So thank you very much, Darius. And now, Darius, it's your turn. Now that you've come to know Porus, and you've heard Porus on several occasions, you've heard his life story, what is your takeaway that you'd like to share with parents and the next generation of entrepreneurs? Uh, thanks. So, so, so it's a, amazing to, to, to meet, meet new, uh, new friends and colleagues and academics, uh, especially an engineer. Uh, what I'm getting from, from Porus is when he has students come to his uh, lab, his group at UT Dallas, he provides them the space, the environment to excel. And that's why he wrote in a slide, Pursuit of Excellence. And we heard about ex uh, excellence uh, over and over again. When you choose something, do something, do it the best you can do it. So that's what I'm getting from it. And not only creating that environment, but if I had another uh, some advice from uh, mentors myself who have done that and then get out of the way and I think that's a similar piece of advice for parents I'm being a parent myself to a nine and seven year old I'm recognizing you give tools you give the environment and then you get out of the way and they will flourish thank you <laughs> the question for Pirus and uh, Percy is going to read his answer Pirus, you have known Darius for years and years and years and years and years and years. And Darius holds you in great awe and respect. Now that you've heard the life story of, of Jehan, what is your takeaway and advice to the parents? And Percy is going to read the yes. answer. Pirus has to say this, I really enjoy or enjoyed Jehan's presentation. I think the objective is the same, me or my father. The path is the same. He is probably going in a Tesla, I may go in a Land Rover, and my father may go in a Mercedes. All said and done, the goal is the same, to ensure somehow we create value for the society. And I wish Jehan all the best, and I wish more youngsters follow Jehan's what I call the Tesla model. So before I uh, pass it on, uh, I would like to say that what Jehan is a second generation entrepreneur. And what he has done, he has taken his father's old way of doing business to the next level by using technology. And that is what youth brings to the table. They bring new ideas, new technology, and then you go to the next level. And every youngster who is present here today should take an example from Jehan, because he has really done a wonderful job. And I think that all youngsters uh, present here should take a leaf out of his book. Thank you. Jehan, you've told me that you are in awe of Piruz and his accomplishments. What advice or what takeaway would you like to share with parents and their children that, Je that you would like them to know about Pirouz, what he's done, and his accomplishments. Right. So before I answer that question, um, I think one thing that I missed out, and Adel actually, and so I'm just going to go back to my previous question, uh, and Adel actually told me this, and I think it made it a lot of sense uh, for the parents and across India and globally, is that give your kids the right roots, and at the same time give them wings to fly. So. I think that summarizes that very beautifully. And coming to your question on, on how with Piroz and even Captain, uh, typically, if I, I think out of all of you, and a lot of you are from or have been from India, how many of you know of this slogan, I love you, Rasna? Anyone? Hands up? Right? OK, so all of them have heard this. So it's, Rasna is a pretty big brand in India. And uh, Piroz and his, his father and now his children uh, what I really like them, they've truly actually done with passion, persistence, perseverance, fought the multinationals like the Cokes and the Pepsis of the world to keep that brand identity and keep their company strong. Uh, over the years, if you see, most companies had sold out to uh, multinationals. And Piru's being what he is, extremely genuine. If you've heard him talk, 
uh, super, super authentic guy. Uh, what I truly admire about him, and, and I think that's super important for all entrepreneurs and leaders across the board, is to have fortitude. And what I mean by that is just pure, pure persistence and never give up, no matter what. And Mira, for example, like what happened with COVID, all of us entrepreneurs, all of us you know, in businesses, we've gone through ups and downs, but all of us stayed to the path and made sure that we delivered. So I think for me, Piroz is just persistence. The sound of Rointon, now that you've known Mira for a couple of months, what advice, uh, listening to her and coming to know her, what advice would you like to pass on to parents and their children, based on what you know about Mira? What, first of all, if you notice, there are six of us. Of course, Piruz is from connecting from Ahmedabad, Percy is rep representing him. We have one female Zarthusti and five guys. I hope that one thing that the parents would imbibe is, and you must have heard Professor Mazarin Banaji talk about it yesterday. Next World Zoroastrian Congress, I hope that ratio comes close to 50-50. Yep. Second, thank you. Second, you heard her story of doggedly carrying on, persevering in the face of adversity. My, and I have faced similar situations. Um, never give up as an entrepreneur or even as an individual in whatever profession you choose, when you face adversity, just face it. Do not give up. You know, same thing. Should I? Okay, we're back on. Um, so one of the things that Rowington mentioned in our practice uh, conversations and didn't get the chance to talk about during the, the real deal was this program that he implemented um, in one of his businesses where any employee who was having car troubles um, no matter what, all they had to do was say, hey, I'm having a hard time, I'm, I'm having a hard time getting into work, and they would automatically give them a $500 loan, sight unseen, just give them the loan, let them go to the repair shop and fix their car. And this really touches on um, a business extension of Vohumana, which I would like to say, make others happy to make your business happy. Um, and also falls in line with you know the original Tata Mills, which created these crashes for the women that were working in the mill so that they would be able to have their babies close by in a safe environment, in a clean environment, and would be able to work you know, in the mills. Um, and so creating sort of a better environment for your employees in the same way that the Jehan is doing you know, with improving safety, right? These are all things that actually contribute to your bottom line. You don't do them at the expense of your bottom line. You do them to improve your profitability, to improve your employee loyalty, and to improve the community and the everybody that you're working with. So I think, you know, I, that's a major lesson that I learned from Rowington. I know he's known now for giving away his masses of wealth, which is amazing. Um, and very, very admirable, but he built that wealth in a very responsible way as well. And so I think, you know, the advice that I have for young people is if you want to go out and do something, I think just try. <laughs> like, you'll learn so much more by doing than just by studying about it. Um, you will make mistakes. Mistakes happen. You know, you pick up and you keep on going. And um, I think that's, I guess, all three of us have talked about persistence and persevering, but also just maintain curiosity. You know, anything that you think you care about or you're wondering about, or why is this like that, and it could be like this, like that could be a business idea right there. So maintain that curiosity in your life and, um, you know, try and do well by others as you proceed in your life and you'll have a happy life. Thank you. We now have a number of questions from the audience. The first, I'm going to direct it to the person I think is just right. When there is, when people say panel or the people say uh, leave it blank. The first question is from Rushat Austin. Could you stand up please, Rushat? He's 16 years old. And the question that he has 
is how do I know if I'm good at good risk taker? How do I become comfortable with risk? And Rointan, I would like you to answer that question. How do I know if I'm good, if a good risk, risk taker? How do I know if I am a good risk taker? How do I become comfortable taking risk? And you've taken many different types of risk, hence the question is for you. As they say, don't give away the company store completely. One way you will learn is you need, uh, uh, let me start out by the story of all of us immigrants. Those of us like Farouk and I and Adel, you will always hear the thing about, we came to the US with $8 and a dream. $8 because the Indian government was so broke that when we boarded the plane, the maximum amount of foreign exchange allowed to be converted was $8. So when, when you want to get into a venture, don't just blow it. For example, if you are a guy who want to start an AI business, don't go and invest all of it in some Bitcoin venture. Not that there is anything wrong in Bitcoins. So measure, take small steps. Maybe if you lose a quarter of your hard-earned money that you've saved up, that's fine. But don't bet 120, don't take a loan so that you are actually obligated to pay back 125%. That's my simple two-penny bit advice. Thank you. Richard, I hope that he's answered your question. If he hasn't, he'll be out in the lobby, approach him and follow it up. Nazreen Khosravian. Stand up. Nazreen Khosravian has an answer, has a question. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to direct this question to Mira. So Mira, did you have the family support financially or you took a loan from the bank when you first started it. Great, great question. So the first amount of money that I received was like a business school prize from Harvard. So I entered into this like business school competition and I won $25,000 cash prize. And so I used that to start the business. Um, I then did uh, a Kickstarter campaign and raised another $50,000. And then I did like a friends and family round in which my dad participated, but actually was not the largest participant. I think I got, um, I got some money from like pitch events. I would just go and like pitch the dream and um, ended up being able to land like a $75,000 check from somebody. I got some people from the Harvard Business School Network, especially the Africa Business Club Network, um, a lot of Nigerians who were really excited about somebody who wanted to go back to Nigeria and do something. Um, and the first three years of the business, the business survived on $500,000. So we were really lean. I wasn't paying myself a salary. My mom was sending me $1,000 like every, every month or so, so I could pay my student loans and like survive. Um, more recently in the face of large institutional investors letting us down and as a result of my father's very successful sale of his business, which happened I think five years ago now, um, in a more recent um, round, my parents did provide more significant financial support um, as they were able to do and as I'm very grateful for. So it, you know, it's been a combination, but you know, definitely I have had super, super, super strong support from my parents. Um, after my dad initially asked me, like, why are you moving back to Nigeria? You already lived there once. Um, he got over it and decided that, you know what, she has this dream and I want to support her and I'm going to do everything I can to support her. So uh, it's, been a, it's been a combination. Percy, this question is really directed to you as the president of the World Zoroastrian Chamber of Commerce. It is from Firoza Pantaki. Firoza Pantaki? Ah, there she is. <laughs> there she is. All right. So, Percy, do you plan to have a Zoroastrian version of Shark Tank for WZCC to encourage budding entrepreneurs, <laughs> budding Zoroastrian entrepreneurs? We, we, are, we have already conducted, I think, two Shark Tanks so far, and we are contemplating having another one in London. So, yes, by all means, we'll continue with that. 
And I think uh, a few entrepreneurs have got uh, financed through the shark tanks. Uh, but it's not called shark tanks now. It is called Tiger's Den because of the, <laughs> the uh, copyright issue. But, <laughs> but you Thank can you. definitely apply. No problem. Thank you. This is the last question in this round that I'm going to touch upon. And you've given us your emails. And we, the panel and us, will email you the answers to the questions that you have raised. So you've given us very good sets of questions that is going to be used to come up with a document uh, that we can share later on on the WZCC website, uh, et cetera. So this question is from Alicia Sharma. And I'm going to direct this question to Jehan. In terms of making the biggest impact on causes you are deeply passionate about, what do you think about the trade-off of starting your own venture? That includes longer time, et cetera, et cetera, versus taking your idea to an existing organization and growing it from there. In other words, jump-starting it within a corporation. So <clears throat> that's a tough one. I think it depends on you. It's very subjective. Um, for I don't. I, some people say entrepreneurs are born. Some people say entrepreneurs are made. Uh, it depends on what your goal and dream is, right? Um, how understand that entrepreneurship is is a lot of risk, and with that also comes the rewards. But there is that risk. Uh, if you're someone that just isn't comfortable. It depends which time of life you are at, what, what kind of position. I think it's, it's a super subjective question. But for me personally, I would say um, don't let anyone make the money off your idea. If you have something, all you need is the confidence and you can do it yourself. You don't need anybody else. Trust me on that. Um, so just to take an example out of that, um, my, my own trucking company, we could have built a thousand trucks more on, on the idea of technology that we have. Um, what, what, the reason why I, I you know, spoke to my dad, it was a difficult conversation because that means me leaving in, I know, our, our family company and starting something fresh, um, which I could have done. This is like similar to my own thing, right? Uh, but here the impact is far higher. I know the, the impact of making sure that not only lives will be saved, we'll be able to save uh, like 8 million drivers, 80% of them are single fleet owners. They'll have, uh, you know, some kind of really good income coming through, and th their businesses will survive. So you've got to look at the larger picture. Yeah. Yeah. I've received uh, a tug from Arzan that we need to wrap up, but now uh, I invite Karishma to synthesize what you've heard today. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hamazor, Hama Shoba to our respected Ervat Sahibs and Mabit Sahibs at the back, who teach us how to implement the Zarathushti principles and their meanings. In the context of building global Zarathushti existence and bridging this, our panelists today have talked about the intellectual, the social, and the economic entrepreneurship. They've given their experiences so that we can motivate the youth and their parents, so that together we can all advance towards a better world, the principle of Frasio Kerithi. Making the impossible possible is within our reach when we enhance global Zarthoshti excellence through entrepreneurship. That is the key, because entrepreneurship, as Adel often tells us, and as we've heard today, is the pursuit of opportunity beyond resources available. And you have heard many examples of that today, and I'm sure you can think of many more. So I'd like you, as I speak, to think about the panel at the back, at the bottom. Your journey, your passion, how you listen. You've listened to wonderful speakers today. You've listened to Lord Karan Bilimoria this morning, and you've listened to this beautiful World Zarathustra Congress. As Asho Zarathustra says, with a bright intellect, 
listen, observe, reflect, then decide to grow, and then take action to grow Ushta in Aura Mazda's kingdom. The power of the youth has been motivated and mobilized by the World Zarathustra Chamber of Commerce over several years. It has nurtured the youth, as you have heard Percy Master so eloquently describe today. We have fostered the creation of intellectual, social, and economic value. Each of our panelists has demonstrated how they have empowered the youth and teams, nurturing the fire in each one's belly in a controlled, careful way so that risks can be taken in a harmonious way, a very Zoroastrian principle. And the WZCC seeks to maximize the nexus between the three domains. As you can see on the right there, the economic, the social, and the intellectual. Could I have the previous slide first? Thank you. The emergent property of this synergy is the fravashi within each one of us, which we wear with great honor in our pins. Entrepreneurship has four main aspects. They're opportunity driven, it involves shared vision. It is about collaboration. It is action-oriented. It is based upon values. And it is about taking calculated risks, because it isn't just about each one of us. It is about the us, the US in Ushta. In the context, the next slide, please. In the context of making the impossible possible. The objective of this panel is success with happiness, Ushta, and the commitment to give back to you all, to all of you out there listening to this live stream, and to those of you who will listen to it over many years, many generations, hopefully. And success is in all three domains sometimes on its own, sometimes overlapping at one time, sometimes sequentially. But it necessitates all three domains, like a three-legged stool. To obtain harmony, all three legs need to be well balanced. So let's come now to our youth and how they have listened today, and how each one of us, as in the Ashem Vahu prayer, will base the journeys like our panelists have so beautifully done upon the principle of Asha that which is right for the sake of what is right and good. And we have heard this in each of their stories. At several points in their life, they could have made different choices, but they chose what was good, not just for them, not for a reward, but for the good that they can achieve now in a way that is well done, systematic, harmonious, so that many generations can benefit from this. In Porus's journey, you heard his mother influenced it. He has the service aspect and the pursuit of excellence systematically. He works with integrating knowledge and empowering his students so that they can go on and amplify this in all three domains. He's part of several startups, and his students are part of many, many more examples of these startups. So it is sustainable. So the concept of Frasho Kerati is not just in the future, it is now and in the future. Darius talked about giving students a voice. He gives his students a voice and they give, together with him, society a voice. He works with medics, but he's an engineer. So this concept of intellectual domain has moved on to create value through the startups he has, through his students, and through the social domains. So all three domains again. Piruz received from his father a company. He didn't let status quo take a hold of that. He challenged the status quo. He moved it forward, but he also did one more thing. He responded to what he observed. And he has worked with governments, intellectuals, people in education, and across the board. The key is care. And he cares with the concept of mitra, good contracts. 
Jehan, although he said he was not a good student, forgot to say or chose not to say that he also teaches at the IIN, the Indian Institute of Management. He uses artificial intelligence from the intellectual domain to make lives safer for many, many thousands of people and their families. He has delivered oxygen in COVID times where people could not reach far, far flung parts of India. And he has responded to this like that because he was prepared. Because as you can see, the Amesha Spentas, he says the good mind is based on wisdom, Ahura Mazda, and the spirit of Spenta Mainyu. To build on Asha for Vahukshatra, good strength, as Lord Billamoria said today, power, good power. And in each one of them, as you saw in Ruintan's journey, it's systematic, but it is a maximized overlap for shared wealth. Ruintan's mother, Mehru auntie, has imbibed this in him as all of you do in your children. Mira directly talked about her parents. And she said, it's not just okay to be holistic, but it's important to be holistically the best. And this, she says, helps her drive impact. So while Rohintan says, empower the employees and care for them, as he said, the concept of spentam armaiti for the critical assistance grant, Mira does something very similar, and she looks after everybody. So this concept in the world, Zarthoshti Chamber of Commerce, as you will see on the right, is the principle of the Yenge Hatam prayer to celebrate collaboration. Okay. Two minutes, one and a half minutes left. The principle is to bridge and to celebrate. So when we say the theme of the world's Zarthoshti Chamber of Commerce is to bridge Zarthoshti existence through excellence, the WZCC has this at its heart, has you all at its heart, and has the future of the Zarthoshti community through the spirit of the Fravashi in all of us. So we celebrate good action, Atyasne Paiti Vango, good action, to build a better world, taking challenges, to make opportunities so that we can all flourish using the good mind, but using the concept of the Yasnaha 30.2. Think, reflect, and take action. Yes, calculated risk, but in the now, because we are prepared. The Gothic word for that is nuchit. So as each one of you today imbibes the spirit of the Fravashi to go forward, fra, go forward, asha, you know what that means, kereti, good action. We wish you all the very best to learn from us in the panel and Professor Mystery and take this continuity forward to benefit us all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Karan Bilimoria, uh, who will, he will share with us some closing thoughts. He doesn't need an introduction. A long introduction was given to him a long time back, earlier this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow, that was a fantastic panel. I was sitting there and I've learned a huge amount and it's triggered enormous amounts that I'm going to share with you now that's been triggered by them. So uh, first, uh, Farouk, you've been, what a wonderful chair you've been. You've done that with such grace and, and so politely keeping people on, on, on time. Um, and and, and your, your brother would be proud of you. Uh, um, <laughs> Percy, congratulations on being the new, new uh, chair of the WZCC. And uh, Edel, where is Edel Dava? Thank you for all you've done. You've been amazing, absolutely amazing. And, and my mother sends you her regards. Uh, so, uh, Porus, uh, you know, the pursuit of excellence, which was fantastic. And, and this whole concept of growth mindset. You know the growth mindset? Constantly being curious. One of my favorite sayings of Mahatma Gandhi, live as if you're going to die tomorrow, learn as if you're going to live forever. And, and that non-stop learning. Then you spoke about service, and it's all about service leadership. Her Majesty the Queen, I've been so privileged to serve her 
to, 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 be, to have met her many, many times, and this time in the Platinum Jubilee, 70 years, and her whole life has been about service leadership. Um, the motto of Sandhurst, the military academy in the UK, serve to lead. The motto of the Indian Military Academy, my father commissioned General Bill Moria, the Military Academy, uh, in, if I paraphrase it, the honor and safety and welfare of your country comes first always and every time. The safety and welfare of your troops comes second always and every time. And your own safety and welfare comes last always and every time. And the Dalai Lama, I've had the privilege of, of meeting him and he talks about serving his people. So it's all about service leadership. Uh, the legacy, you spoke about legacy, it's really important. You know, think about it. One of the best lectures I've ever attended in my life was Professor Clay Christensen at Harvard Business School, and his message was very simple. He's written a book about it. He said, how many, if you can ask you all, of, all this question, how many of you have stopped and thought, what is the purpose of my life? It's a very individual question. I see one hand going up, but I mean, not many of us have done it. Be honest with yourself. And then link to that, how will you measure your life? So, uh, Darush, uh, you spoke uh, about uh, speaking softly, being compassionate. Uh, Piruz of Rasna, what a, what a great, great business. Uh, impact, uh, making money, making health, and talking about sustainability. And a lot of what he said are two of the sayings that I love being the best in the world, but also the being the best for the world. And, and not just what you do, but how you do it, which is fantastic. And then he gives 10% of his profits in CSR. The message about collaboration, collaboration with government he spoke about, collaboration with universities, collaboration with universities, all three, which I spoke about in my speech. Inclusive growth, he spoke about inclusive growth. Uh, Jehan, Wow, that's inspirational what you're doing with the safest trucking company using AI, saving 100 lives a day. Hats off to you. Well done. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. And what, what you also said, love what you're doing. One of my favorite sayings is follow your passion, not your pension. Yeah. Um, and, and Rowington, again, what an inspiration you are about c quoting Carnegie about spending a third of your life living, third of your, uh, learning, third of your life, learning, third of your life, wealth, third of your life, giving it away. And Mira, Congratulations on what you're doing. And, and you know, the, you went back into the background of competitive sports. Now, I'm a, I'm a Cambridge Blue, um, and you know, now more and more Cambridge is getting just academics and nothing else. And we did a survey at Cambridge commissioned by one of the Pro, Vi the Pro Vice Chancellor of Education, who was a contemporary of mine, and he was not a sportsman. Yeah. And this survey surveyed the elite sportsmen and women at Cambridge, the Blues, the ones who got Blues, and they, they discovered they achieved better results than the rest of the university. You know, and it just shows how important extracurricular activities are, the teamwork you spoke about, the discipline, the time management, that it, it's, it's real and it's true. And the way you increase the productivity from five tons to 50 tons, wow, again, hats off to you. Brilliant, inspirational. <laughs> then in, in, and then uh, the professor drew out these excellent lessons from all of you, uh, porous about, you spoke about purpose, passion, providence. Now, you know, I've never, I've been to three business schools, I'm an alumnus of three business schools, I've never done one case study on luck. And luck is real. The best definition of serendipity I've heard is from Professor Mark Durand at the Cambridge Judge Business School, which I chaired for five years. He says, serendipity is seeing what everyone else sees, but thinking what no one else has thought. And the best definition of luck I've ever heard is in the Harvard Business School classroom, Luck is when determination meets opportunity. If you're not determined, you won't even see the opportunity. And it's like waves that pass you in your life. If you're determined, you might just catch one of those waves. If you're not determined, those waves will just keep going past you all your life. So determination meets opportunity. Um, then the, the other uh, pillars talk about doing things. Now, the difference between manager, leader, entrepreneur. I love the lion analogy. You know, lion in a zoo, lion in a circus, lion in the jungle. Um, but, but also, I, there's another thing. Managers do things right. Leaders do the right thing. Um, so that's uh, the way I, I've always looked at it. And then uh, Jahan talking about having faith and, um, and then uh, rowing to the, the, the Zoroastrian values of trust and integrity and harmony. Mira, um, again, you spoke about now when you believe in something. 
And this is for those of you who want to start your business one day, the young entrepreneurs, or those of you who just started out. You know, I remember those days when I was in my 20s. I had nothing, I had no money. I had zero credibility. And I call it crossing the credibility gap. How do you cross the credibility gap when you have zero credibility? How do you get people to finance you, supply you, and buy from you when nobody knows you, nobody knows your business, you have no credibility? And they do those things if you have passion and faith and confidence and belief in yourself and your idea and your product and your brand. It gives people the confidence and the faith to trust you, to give you a chance, and then you cross that credibility gap. So it's all about faith and confidence and belief and passion. So credibility back, that message came out. Uh, MBA, new definition, <laughs> I won't go into that. Uh, then, Darius, you spoke about the, the tools and environment and then get out of the way. Well, government is meant to create the environment for business to flourish and then get out of the way. But do they? <laughs> um, and then, Jan we, and Rowington, you both spoke about never giving up. And you know this, we've gone through two years of hell through the pandemic. Look at this, we're all here. And one of Winston Churchill's, one of my favorite things of Winston Churchill's, is when you're going through hell, keep going. And we've kept going, and we've come out the other side. Um, the Duke of Wellington, his, his, his motto, fortune favors the brave, fortune favors the bold. And then, Mira, you, you brought up the point about, what, about making people happy when you do business. And the, the, the technical term for this is stakeholder capitalism. The term I've always used instinctively when I started my business is the partnership model. So you don't treat your customers wonderfully and bully your suppliers and bully your employees and make big profits, which, by the way, the horrible business person you can think of, we all know some of them, operate in that way. The way to do it, I believe, is treat everyone as a partner, your customer, your supplier, your employees, your lawyers, your accountants, your ad agency, your PR agency, they're all your partners. And that partnership model, I think, is a much better way of doing it. Mira then also said, just try it. Mistakes happen. One of my favorite sayings, good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. So there's no shortcut to making the mistakes and learning from them. And finally, Karishma, thank you so much for uh, summarizing everything with the intellectual, the social, the economic, and making the impossible possible. Finally, I want to conclude with this, and I think we're bang on time. Um, two things. I want to ask you all a question no right or wrong answer, and I'm doing this for a reason, because it hasn't come up in the panel. No right or wrong answer. Be honest with yourselves and with me. How many of you think you're creative? If you think you're creative, put your hand up. If you think you're not creative, keep your hands down. Just keep them up or down, and I want to have a look around. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. So when I ask this question around the world, the average is half the people with their hands up, half the people keep their hands down. If you go to see my mother in Dehradun, she has a cabinet in the sitting room with the most beautiful porcelain and china and pottery. And in amongst all this is a pottery angel. It is the ugliest angel you have seen in your life, made by me as a boy. <laughs> Karen, you're doing well academically. Keep going. You'll do well, but you're not creative. I was useless at art. You will learn to play the piano. I passed grade one. My Cambridge contemporary Cyrus Mehta was playing the violin beautifully now. That's a musician. I mean, I passed grade one. Please give up. Spare us. You're tone deaf. Not creative. You know, all my schooling, all my university, I was told and believed that I was not creative. And when I started my own business, when I became an entrepreneur, when I started Cobra Beer, I realized the most important skill of being an entrepreneur is the ability to be creative and innovative. And I'm very, very creative. So let us, if I say around the world, if we could encourage, I've been on the Times Education Commission, and we've recommended this, encourage children from a young age at every school in the world to unleash that creative spirit that is within every one of us. And I tell you, the GDP growth rate of the world will quadruple if we were to do that. So creativity, and that's the big message I would add to everything that this wonderful panel has said. And I leave you with this. Thank you, all of you, for being here. My, my, my father, the late General Bill Amoria, when I asked for advice when I first started work, I was going to work with Ernst & Young in London, and I, he'd become a general. I had to get an appointment from his ADC to see him. He said, you want advice about work? You come and see me in my office. 
So I remember seeing him in this huge office, and I asked Dad for advice, and he gave me the best advice. This is when I was a youngster starting my first job. And he said, son, you're going to start at the bottom. You'll be given lots of jobs. You'll be given lots of tasks. The first thing when you're given a task is do it. The next thing is do that little bit extra that you were not asked to do, and that's the best advice I've been given in my life. Because my father was saying, always take the initiative. Always be innovative. Always be creative. And always go the extra mile. So thank you very much. And congratulations to the World Zoroastrian Congress. You have been brilliant. It's been a privilege for me to be with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all very much. Please uh, rise and give a uh, ovation to all these folks, including Edel Dava and Rustam uh, Engineer, who have mentored this panel, and Vispi Engineer, where's Vispi, uh, sorry, Vispi uh, Karkaria. These are the folks who practiced with us for the last two and a half months. Thank you all.